So AWS Serverless actually consists of multiple services that enable us to build and run serverless applications by providing us with fully managed services which do not require us to provision, maintain and administer servers for backend components. So which for now may not be important to the user but they play a huge role in the lives of the developers and the architects. These components can be like your compute, database, storage, stream processing and message queues. And before getting into all these complicated terms, we first need to start from the basics. So let's start off with our basic understanding of what is serverless and why has everyone inclined towards designing serverless applications or serverless architectures. So now if I ask you to design an application from scratch and if I give you a hefty budget and I ask you to take your own ideas to design this application, host it and make it available to the users, you will have a very straightforward approach if it's with an on-premise solution. And here, when I'm talking about application hosting, it is in the perspective of giving you a very simple example. So please don't get emotional or sensitive. This is just an example. Okay, so there are surely multiple ways to do it. But this is a very simple example that I wanted to give. So let's see the example here. So when it comes to our application hosting, you have your application servers, and along with that, you would need your developers to develop your application that you want to host on the server. And there comes a very important point. You will need computation resources, you will need memory and storage space, and to align your application to be accessed across the public facing or private facing interfaces, you would need your networking blocks. And all these things that are mentioned here need, first, your developers to develop the application. Secondly, you have to provision the resources based on the demand of the application with obviously your vision of how much traffic you're going to expect or how much traffic you are expecting to have and you need to spare resources to provision database the deployment of the database and maintenance of it and other local storage to store your application data and you will have your networking team to provide the subnets needed to host your application and all these will have so many overheads and that is why moving to the cloud is now considered to be a better approach. But having said that, we also know that we can have a hybrid architecture as well. I know you might be ready to put that in the comments section as well and I totally agree with you. But for now, so I just want to tell you that. So just for us to be in context, just think of two ways, one with the on-premise and one with the cloud. Okay, so now let's see the approach with AWS. So when we move to a cloud-based architecture, we move from the conventional ways of provisioning resources. First, that will remain common between all the architectures is that your developers have to develop the application. You have to write the code. That is the basic first step, isn't it? Secondly, you have to provision the resources based on the demand of your application and your vision of how much traffic you are expecting to have. So instead of doing it manually in AWS, what you can do, you can attach auto scaling groups to scale instances and those instances and their capacity and performance can be done over the cloud as well. That's what makes the cloud very convenient, isn't it? Next, you need to provision database, which on AWS you can host on your own EC2 instances. And I'm not commenting on how you deploy it as you all are very well aware of it by now. And you are free of the maintenance and other local storage uh, to store your application data because it comes attached to it based on the configuration that you provide. And with security groups, you can handle the network traffic and you can as well attach it behind the elastic load balancer to host your applications request and the traffic. All these features that you see here started a movement for easier and effective application deployment. But there were overheads here as well that was related to its deployment and management of your own resources and how you want to handle them. But what if your idea of hosting application revolved only around how effective and imperative your time is that you spent for the deployment. Now you wanted to remove that overhead from your architecture where you had the need to just think of your application itself and not how you want to provision servers or resources around it. Isn't it? That's a very good point and that's a very valid point. And that's where the idea originated for a cloud service provider managed serverless infrastructure, where you just had to worry about the application or the product at hand and not the service. With serverless, you need to bring your own code or application and you don't have to worry about the application hosting. 
you will be provided with the computational resources that you need to create a productive application with high availability and power that it needs to serve its consumers. And with this, you and your consumers will be satisfied. And that's what it means to be serverless. Serverless doesn't mean that there are no servers or serverless doesn't mean that there are less number of servers. It means that you don't have to worry about the servers or how to manage them. You need high performance, you'll get it. You need high availability, you will get it. You need an API gateway, you will get it. And you need a robust database, surely you will get it. And the biggest advantage that you have with this is that you will have a lower cost of ownership because you don't have to structure the servers and the time that you use to spend on designing these architectures and maintaining these servers, you can put that precious time on making your applications better. And please don't get confused when I'm talking about maintaining servers. I am actually talking about the application deployment itself and I'm not talking about patching or the things that AWS does to manage its servers. I'm sure you can relate to it and I'm sure you can relate to what I'm explaining here as well. So if I have to reiterate it once again, so the biggest advantage that you have with this is that you will have a lower cost of ownership because you don't have to structure the servers and the time you used to spend on designing these architectures and maintaining these servers, you can put that precious time on making your applications better. Okay, so I hope that was clear. Let's move on. So now that we have discussed the way we reached the stage in computing with serverless, let's talk about some pointers with serverless. And let's do some introspection on these two things. So first off, let's talk about what is serverless. So what AWS tells us is that serverless is the native architecture of the cloud that enables you to shift more of your operational responsibilities. Remember, shift more of your operational responsibilities to AWS, increasing your agility and innovation. Can I ask you something? Are you aware of what is a native architecture? If not, don't worry. It's very simple. So native architecture is a design principle which is used to design applications and services which are built specifically to exist in the cloud, like microservices, isn't it? So I hope you remember that I told you that time that to just think of either an on-premise solution or cloud-based solution. And we also had an argument about hybrid architecture as well. So you can come out of that and think of the overheads of using the default deployment steps we follow when we use AWS Cloud. With this, you can shift some of your resources that you used to manage before to serverless and use it more effectively. Like shifting your EC2 hosted database to a serverless Aurora database or a Dynamo database. Like shifting your EC2 computation to AWS Lambda. And like shifting your data stores from local storage to AWS simple storage service, that is S3. And this eliminates infrastructure management tasks such as server or cluster provisioning, patching, operating system maintenance and capacity provisioning. And you will get everything that is required to scale and run your application with high availability. So that's one less thing to worry about. And next thing that we have here is why you use serverless. So as I've already mentioned before, with serverless, you need to bring your code or application and you don't have to worry about the application hosting. You will be provided with the computational resources that you need to create a productive application with high availability and the power that it needs to serve its customers requests. And as AWS tells us, serverless enables you to build modern applications with increased agility and lower cost of ownership or lower total cost of ownership. With this reduced overhead, it lets your developers get more time and energy, which in turn can be spent on developing reliable applications. And the following can be termed as the pillars of modern applications. So first one is the faster to market. So it means that it reaches your customers on time because you can spend more time now designing productive applications rather than thinking about the overheads of maintaining the servers. The second one is increased innovation. So it obviously means like you get more time to innovate. And the third one is improved reliability. And the fourth one is reduced cost. I think this we have already discussed. And all these make up for a serverless architecture. So with the evolution of AWS serverless, it was first initially restricted to serverless compute, that is by using AWS Lambda. I know all of you might be aware of AWS Lambda. If you don't know, then it's just fine. But now AWS has spanned it across multiple services and across multiple domains like compute, storage, data stores, API proxy, application integration, 
orchestration and analytics as well and and these servers are very interesting to learn so we might discuss some of them in depth and others which are more conceptual we will discuss them in brief so if you see here for compute we have aws lambda lambda at edge and aws fargate so don't worry about them if you are aware of them we will discuss them one by one so for storage we have aws s3 and aws efs and for data storage we have aws dynamodb aws uh, or aurora database aws rds proxy and for api proxy we have api gateway for application integration we have aws sns sqs app sync and aws event bridge for orchestration analytics we have aws step functions kinesis and aws athena and most of these we have already covered so the green ticks that you see here we have covered most of the services that we wanted to cover in serverless before itself but most of the important services are still there and we will cover them one by one so don't worry about them and along with aws serverless computation we also have aws serverless developer tools for the serverless framework we have aws sam which is also known as aws serverless application model and for continuous integration and deployment we have aws code star aws code pipeline aws code deploy and aws code build and for monitoring logging and diagnostics we have aws cloudwatch and aws x-ray and at last for authoring and development we have aws cloud9 and aws sam cli so that is basically your aws serverless application model cli now tell me do you have your concepts cleared on the line mentioned here build and run applications without thinking about servers that's the whole gist of being serverless you have to just focus on building a resilient application and the rest will be handled by the cloud provider okay so now let's do some recap on serverless capabilities the first one we have is no server management so rest assured you don't have to provision or maintain any servers and second one we have is pay for value so it's a very interesting term pay for value remember that so this is a very important point and everyone must be aware of this is that the whole glory about serverless has a caveat that boils down to the cost remember that you have to pay for consistent throughput and execution duration rather than by the server unit itself so you only pay for the request transaction and aws charges you for only that and not for the server usage itself remember that okay for every transaction that you make or every consistent throughput or execution that you make you will be charged for that itself and the third one we have is flexible scaling so when it comes to performance of your application your application can be scaled automatically or by adjusting its capacity through toggling the units of consumption rather than the units of individual servers it means that with the increased demand or traffic it will automatically scale and it can scale up or down based on the requirement automated high availability is self-explanatory that it is automated high availability so when you use serverless computation it provides built-in availability and fault tolerance so if there is any easy failure also you'll not get to notice about that and that's the very good part i think isn't it so that was it for the introduction of aws serverless and i hope you got a very good insight on what is serverless and why there is a need for serverless computing and this being a very crucial part of cloud computing I would request you to read more about this in the documentations as well and don't worry we will discuss the services and we will discuss them with real-time examples and architectures and this was just to give you a preview on things to come so next topic will be on aws lambda so don't miss out on that so that's it from my side until next time it's pytholic signing off